the interruption, but good morning and we very warmly welcome to the monthly lecture series organized by N Mahalingam Center for Public Policy and School of Economics of Kumaruguru College of Liberal Arts and Science. And we are greatly honored to have Professor C. Rangarajan, former governor of RBI and chairman of Mera School of Economics. I'm also pleased to give you a brief background about Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science and also N Mahalingam Center for Public Policy. Class established in 2018 is a young emerging college of Kumaraguru group of institutions in Coimbatore, which was founded by Dr. N Mahalingam in 1984. The Liberal Arts College offers 10 undergraduate programs, including economics and political science, two masters and three PhD programs. Yen Mahalingam Center for Public Policy was launched on May 2nd, 2022, as a part of centenary celebrations of the founder chairman, Arup Chilver, Dr. N. Mahalingam Ayya. NCPP, NMCPP is a tribute to this great educationalist, industrialist, scholar, and statesman who pioneered initiatives, policies, and championed causes worthy of state and public interest during his tenure as the chairman of the Tamil Nadu State Planning Commission and also as a member of Tamil Nadu Legislative Assembly for 15 years. The center is a multidisciplinary hub to advance public policy goals through developmental research, education, and advocacy by engaging with government, industry, and also think tanks. And to com commence the monthly lecture series for 2023 from the center, we are extremely honored to have Professor C. Rangarajan with us today. He needs no introduction, but it's very important for us to understand his background and his great contribution to our nation. Dr. C. Rangarajan is a leading economist of India who has played a key role both as an academic and a policymaker. He has held several important positions, which include Governor of Reserve Bank of India and Governor of Andhra Pradesh. Dr. C. Rangarajan was the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister in the rank of Cabinet Minister, a position he has held from 20, January 20, 2005 to 2014, except during 2008 to 9, when he was a member of the parliament. During 2003 and 2004, he was the chairman of the 12th Finance Commission, a constitutional commission set up every five years to determine the sharing of tax revenues between central and state governments. Dr. Rangarajan was governor of Reserve Bank of India during 1992 to 97, at a time when India embarked on wide ranging economic reforms, which fundamentally altered the structure of the Indian economy. He was actively involved in, this, in the design and implementation of reform of the reform agenda. The path-breaking reforms that he implemented during this period include deregulation of interest rates, strengthening of the banking system by a gradual tightening of prudential norms, creating nurturing of financial markets, and giving them depth and vibrancy, shifting to market-determined exchange rates making the rupee convertible to the current account and the cessation of automatic monetization of the budget deficit. India has become a member of Bank of International Settlements during this, his time as a governor. After obtaining his honors degree from Madras, he obtained his PhD from University of Pennsylvania. In the United States, he started, he taught in Wharton School of Finance and Commerce, University of Pennsylvania, 
and Graduate School of Business Administration, New York University. In India, he taught at Lyla College, Madras, University of Rajasthan, the Indian Institute, New De in Indian Statistical Institute, New Delhi, and for well over a decade and a half at IAM Ahmedabad. He was also a fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute at Washington. He was the president of the Indian Economic Association in 1988 and the president of Indian Econometric Society in 1994. He was the conference president of the Indian Economic Association in the centenary year of 20, 2017. He's the author of several books on Indian economy. Among others, these include Tracking the Indian Economy, a collection of articles, Counting the Poor, Where Do We Stand? Federalism and Physical Transfers in India. India, Monetary Policy, Financial Stability and Other Essays. Selected Essays on Indian Economy, vol two volumes and Indian Economy Essays on Money and Finance. We would strongly encourage our students and other fellow colleagues to read these books to have better understanding of the economy and his views on the uh, economy of India. Dr. Rangarajan was the recipient of several prestigious awards, notable among them have been Honorary Fellow of the Indian Institute of Ahmedabad, Alumni Award for Outstanding Leadership by Wharton Indian Economic Forum, and the Finance Man of the Decade by the Bombay Management Association. In recognition of his distinguished service to the country, the government honored him with Padma Vibhushan in 2002, the highest, the second highest civilian honor. He was a recipient of Professor C. Mahalan Bonis National Award in Lifetime Achievement category in 2020. He was awarded the first Dr. C. B. Rao Centenary Gold Medal for Lifetime Achievement by the Indian Econometric Society in 2021. He was a recipient of the honorary doctorate from several universities. He is currently the chairman of Madras School of Economics. We are genuinely excited and eagerly looking forward to your enlightened lectures, enlightening lectures, sir. Your wealth of knowledge and insight will undoubtedly offer invaluable perspectives on this topic and contribute to the intellectual growth of our students and the wider community. I welcome the viewers to join the significant lecture and post your questions and thoughts in the chat and we will take a couple of questions in the end. Sir, I welcome you to address the viewers. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, Dr. Vajilla Kennedy, Dr. Piri Swami, and friends. I'm indeed very happy to be with you this morning and to address you uh, through the forum of Dr. Mahalingam Center for Public Policy and the Kumaraguru College of Art, Liberal Arts and Sciences. Dr. Mahalingam uh, played an important role in shaping Tamil Nadu's economy, polity, and society as an educationist, legislator, and as chairman of the State Planning Commission. Dr. Mahalingam was also deeply interested in public policy making and implementation. I propose to speak to you this morning about policy instruments and their impact. Policy making and implementation involve three steps. One, having a policy framework or a strategy of development. Second, choice of suitable policy instruments 
to achieve the objectives. And thirdly, assessing the impact of actions taken in order to achieve the objectives. Let me illustrate from India's history since independence on the broad question of the policy framework or strategy for a development. The record of British rule in India in the first half of the 20th century, that is between 1900 and 1950, was dismal. And the average annual rate of the growth of the economy during the five decades was 0.89%. And at that time, the population in India was increasing at 0.84%. As a consequence, the per capita income of the country uh, did not increase at all in the first half of the 20th century. Naturally, immediately after independence, the major goal of the government was to accelerate economic growth. The strategy of development that, adopt, that was adopted at that time had four elements as part of it. One was raising the savings and investment rate. The second was to determine the role of state. Third, the adoption of the policy of import substitution. And fourth, industrialization with an emphasis on heavy industry. I will not this morning go into a detailed analysis of each one of the elements of the strategy of development, but only broadly indicate that what the, what the independent, uh, the, what the government immediately after independence decided was that if we have to accelerate economic growth in our country, the savings rate must go up and simultaneously the investment rate must go up. Uh, the, writings or the rules emphasize the need for raising the savings rate. The, rising, the writings of Herald and Domar emphasize the need for raising the investment rate in order to accelerate a growth. Um, the the, the Herald Domar model, uh, the growth rate is determined by the investment rate uh, divided by the incremental capital output ratio. That is, if a nation has to move forward then it depends upon the level of the investment rate and the level of the efficiency with which that capital is used. Secondly, the strategy of development also emphasized the role of the state. The state had to play an important role in the economic activity in order to correct what came to be known as market failure. Market failure essentially implies a failure or the inability of the market to perform its function. This was particularly felt in the area of investment because of the myopic character of the participants. The participants, that is the invest investors, did not have a good long-term outlook and therefore may not be, might not be forthcoming in terms of investment. And that is why the state had to play an important role. Thirdly, import substitution, which meaning the policy, adoption of the policy of import substitution, which essentially meant that we in India should make whatever we were importing. And the fourth was, of course, on emphasis on heavy industry, like making steel or machines to make machines and so on. Uh, that was derived from the Mahalanobis model, even though the Mahalanobis model is strictly valid only in a closed economy. What happened? Whenever we talk about the policy framework and policy instruments, we need to look at what is the net result of whatever policies that we have adopted and whatever instruments that we have used. In the first three decades after Indian independence, uh, the, the rate of growth of the Indian economy was 3.6%. At that time, population was growing as 2.2%. With the result, the per capita income was growing at 1.4%. Since 
Certainly, this was an improvement over what the British did in the first 50 years, but it certainly fall, fell short of our own expectation and the growth rate uh, of uh, some of our uh, some of the countries, even in Asia. In 1980s, the growth rate improved, but what happened was this was bought at a great cost of high um, fiscal deficit and high current account deficit. And that resulted in the crisis of 1991. The crisis of 1991 was converted into an opportunity to bring about some fundamental changes in India's economic uh, policy. The break happened in three important ways. One was in terms of the uh, role of the state in dismantling the vast multitude of controls and permits and licenses that were required as part of the planned economy that we had before. And thirdly, uh, to give up the policy of import substitution and embrace global trade and develop the abilities to compete effectively in the world market. So these were the three important ele elements um, of the strategy of development since the 1991 uh, crisis and the uh, new economic policy that we adopted at that particular time. Um, I will not go into it this morning uh, in a detailed way about what happened to India, India's economy since 1991. Uh, but broadly speaking, it is very quite clearly that the rate of economic growth um, um, increased substantially during the uh, period. Uh, in the early period, it was 6.2% per annum. Then it jumped to 7.4% per annum. And, and more recently, uh, it has been around 6.7%. But then we had other problems like COVID-19 and so on. So the, pro, the, the idea is that the break with the past came in order to accelerate economic growth. If you look at it in terms of economic growth, certainly the performance has been better. But the post-1991 economic performance also indicates that growth cannot be taken for granted because of reforms. Since 2011-12, the growth rate of the Indian economy has been somewhat lower than the previous period. Therefore, in the language or in the jargon of the economists, reforms are a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Along with the reforms, we really need to see that the investment climate in the country is appropriate and the level of the investment rate continues to remain at a high level if you want to accelerate growth. Let me slightly shift the stand and talk about what are the policy instruments that are available to the government in order to achieve whatever objectives they may have. One is fiscal policy. The other is monetary policy. And the third is the direct controls. When we had a planned economy in our country, direct controls through licenses, permits, and permits um, are the mechanisms through which, which the, the government tried to implement whatever ideas that they had. Um, uh, they had. But um, these become less important as the economy becomes more and more market uh, de determined. But fiscal policy is an important instrument of economic policy. Fiscal policy broadly implies all actions taken to raise, uh, not to, to influence government expenditures, government revenues, and government borrowing. All actions which have a bearing on the, um, which have a bearing and an impact on expenditures, revenues, and borrowing are called, uh, will constitute a fiscal uh, policy. So when we, Look at fiscal policy as an instrument. Here again, we can apply the same rule that I said, namely about objectives or strategy. Second, the nature of the instruments that we, the tools that we adopt. And finally, effectiveness. 
Because in fiscal policy, the most important thing is we use various instruments, either raising revenues or through increasing expenditures or decreasing expenditures. But the idea is essentially to find out what impact it had on the society and what was the effectiveness of the, uh, uh, let's say, the public expenditures. I'll come back to it because that is a very critical area which is uh, which we should need to take into account because ultimately the utility of using one instrument as against another instrument uh, depends upon uh, the impact it has and the extent to which the original objectives of fiscal policy are implemented. Now let me tell you what determines the public expenditure of a government or a state, either at the state level or at the level or at or the central um, or at the union level. Let us look at the public expenditure as a proportion of GDP in several countries. For example, in Japan, public expenditure is 46% of GDP. In Sweden, it is 53%. In UK, it is 50%. In the United States, it is 46%. And in India, it is 30, 31%. At the outset, I must say, the extent of public expenditure depends on the political philosophy of the state. The Bentham formulated a proposition which said that government is best, which governs the least. This we may call it as the minimalist doctrine. That is, the state had only a very limited role to play. But that view has been given up by most states. The other extreme of the minimalist doctrine is that the state must run everything. Probably a purely a communist society or a communist government um, will do that. That everything, as uh, the earlier Marxist saying was about, all the means of production should be owned by the, by, by the government. Then in which case, all economic activity is concentrated in the hands of the state. But most countries have moved in between. We today, today call a welfare state. Namely, the role of the North state as Adam Smith adumbrated, was limited to three areas. One was protecting, uh, maintaining law and order. Second, protecting the state from um, external aggression. And third, maintenance of certain expenditures which, kept, which will not be done by the markets. Therefore, the, these three limited areas were all were given to the state. But we have now moved towards the concept of a welfare state, where we think that the role of the state, besides the first two things, which everybody accepts are, are the roles of the state, uh, that is maintaining law and order inside the country and protecting the country from external aggression, which is uh, accepted by all. But the point really is that the state we now regard has an important role in providing physical infrastructure and social infrastructure like health education. That is the concept of a welfare state, namely that the welfare of the people is a critical element in the strategy of uh, development. Now, when I told you about the expenditures, public expenditures, as a proportion of GDP, you found that countries like Sweden and UK have almost 50% of the GDP um, done through the, um, uh, 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 or constitute public expenditure. But let me also tell you 
that the fact that the public expenditure of a state, which I mean the government, being above 50% does not mean it is a quasi-socialist or a quasi-communist state. It does not. The government may increase expenditure, but that expenditure may result in the production of or in the creation of architect degrees in the private sector. Take, for example, the government spending a lot of money on defense and um, spending money on um, building planes and so on. But the planes may not be built or may, may, not, may, may not be manufactured by the state. The planes may be manufactured by, by the private sector. But the planes may be bought by the government. Therefore, the expenditure is taken as part, is, uh, yeah, uh, as, an, uh, as a proportion of the state may go off, but that does not necessarily result in the production of economic activities being in the hands of the, the government. India's um, public expenditure, both as the center and the states, constitute now 31% of the GDP. If you ask anybody, everyone will say that we need to increase public expenditure. But our public expenditure as a proportion of GDP is low because we are not able to raise the revenue because expenditure can be incurred only if there is adequate revenue. Therefore, the actual public expenditure not only depends upon the political philosophy. I think the political philosophy of India, both at the center and in the states, is to create a welfare state. But our ability to create a welfare state also depends upon how much we are able to raise revenue. Therefore, <coughs> as we move along, the proportion of public expenditure may increase. Therefore, the point to which I wish to make is, while it is true that the public expenditure as a proportion of GDP stems from the political philosophy, the actual public expenditure will also have to depend upon the level of the GDP and the level of the revenue raising capability. Therefore, as a public policy, while we may want to increase public expenditures, we need to look at three aspects of it. One is the size, about which I talked. The other is composition. What determines the composition of public expenditure? Public expenditure is the total expenditure of the government in a federal country like ours, both at the center and the center, and the center and the state level. So, what determines the composition of the public expenditure? How much will it spend on defense? How much will the government spend on um, education? health. This again flows from the political philosophy of the state. A welfare state would want to spend a lot more on health, education, and similar other activities aimed towards promoting uh, the well-being of, of, the, of the people. Therefore, the composition of the expenditure is also stems from the political philosophy. Those countries which have a minimalist view will spend only on probably creating a public infrastructure, but otherwise it will be restricted only to maintaining law and order and maintaining, um, uh, protecting the country from external aggression. So the, the, the third dimension, or not dimension, the third aspect that we need to look at public expenditure is effectiveness. After all, the expenditures are being incurred with a view to promoting certain objectives. Let's say, let's look at education. And the objective is to improve the literacy level, improve the um, uh, abilities of the uh, people in general, 
and providing when we provide technical education uh, we also want to improve the technical abilities of the uh, students how do we measure the effectiveness of public expenditure when you talk about impact that is where the issue comes in what do we do in order to be able to uh, impact the produce the right results how do you measure the effectiveness in um, public finance we talk about what is called performance budget performance budgeting essentially implies that the budget is looked not in terms of purely the numbers um, of the the the, um, the expenditures in value terms but also look at how well the original purposes with which these expenditures are planned to be or planned to be spent or achieved i take for example one second education the budget allocates certain amount of money for building schools building um hiring teachers uh, providing certain other facilities in the schools and colleges etc in measuring effectiveness many people make a distinction between output and outcome output is very often in terms of the physical counterpart uh, to the expenditure in rupee terms for example in the budget a certain amount of money is allocated for let's say uh, elementary education then it is broken up into building schools as i said earlier hiring teachers first aspect of the performance budgeting is to uh, to find out whether these physical um um goals have been achieved or not whether the planned number of teachers have been recruited whether the number of schools or buildings that have to be constructed have been constructed and so on so this is as i said a physical counterpart uh, to the monetary expenditure so in that sense we can really find out whether uh, the outputs to be generated as implied in the budget happened actually or not whether the number of teachers who have been recruited or whether the number of buildings that have been constructed correspond to what was originally intended but when we talk of outcome it goes beyond output because there is a qualitative aspect to output because in for example the purpose of increasing expenditures on education is to increase the abilities of the people of the students have they learned then it becomes not only whether the teachers have been appointed or whether the teachers of in addition to it we need to look at whether they perform their functions properly and whether the students actually learned what was expected of them for example nowadays there is um um uh, uh, there is um a group of people uh, who um actually look at the quality of education that has been imparted uh, they estimate for example whether students in the say, let us say the 8th standard are able to read and um, um, calculate according to what is expected of a 8th class student or only they are capable of what a 5th or the 6th class uh, student is expected to to do therefore the real problem in public finance is not only to look at whether 
expenditures have been incurred and whether buildings have been constructed and teachers have been appointed, but also whether the students have learned what they are expected to learn. So therefore, when you look at public policy and look at it in terms of uh, the uh, expenditures, one needs to look at not only output, but also the outcome. The, what is the effectiveness of uh, the uh, various actions that have been uh, taken? Now, when looking at fiscal policy, there are many other things that one can talk about. But I will touch only on one point before I go to one other instrument of economic policy. The other is public borrowing. Why does the government borrow? The government borrows because the expenditures they want to um, spend, want to incur, is more than the revenues they can raise. Uh, this is like any, every, any household. Any household, if it spends more than what the household earns, then they can meet the expenditure only by borrowing. Uh, this is true of the government as well. That any excess of expenditure over revenue will have to be met by borrowing. Obviously, in the case of households, there is a limit to which one household can borrow uh, because the lender is very careful. The lender will give the money um, as a loan, will, will provide the loan only when he knows that the household is, has a capability to return the, the loan. Public borrowing essentially means the borrowing of the government from the households what, what they want to borrow. The critical question that has risen in the recent period is that any attempt to borrow beyond a particular point can actually result in the state being unable to meet the repayment requirements. Therefore, like a household, the state also can get into a situation where its ability to repay may be limited. Therefore, more recently, it has been an effort to limit public borrowing. There is one thing about public borrowing which is different from private borrowing. The government has the power and authority to issue notes. Therefore, money can be printed by the, by the government or the RBI or the central bank of the country. But that cannot be used as a mechanism for borrowing infinite amounts because that will result, as we all know, if too much money is created, uh, you will have an inflationary uh, situation. Therefore, the, one of the problems that we had uh, during uh, the crisis of 1991 was that the fiscal deficit, as we call it, of the government started rising and rising. There was a time when the government of India had a revenue surplus. That is, on the revenue account, the income earned, the income raised, not earned, the income raised, was higher than the expenditure. Therefore, the surplus could be utilized for capital expenditure. But this came and converted into this, the, the situation turned and we started, and the government of India started incurring revenue 
deficits. The Fiscal responsibility and the management budget management act that was passed was essentially to see that the borrowing of the government of India is limited, and this limit was set as three percent of the, the of the GDP. The, the rule that was originally introduced was somewhat related to the surplus that is available in the hands of the household. And therefore, if the central government borrows 3% of the GDP, in fact, all the states um, governments borrow 3% of the GDP taken together, then the center and the states taken together will borrow 6% of the GDP. And this limit was set um, on the basis of the household sector savings and financial assets. There have been problems in maintaining this level of fiscal deficit. And as you all know that in the more recent period, uh, the fiscal deficit has been rising. And um, uh, this has an important link with the other policy instrument that we talk about, which is the monetary policy. I do not have the time to talk a great deal about monetary policy, but I, this morning I will talk only about the link between monetary policy and a fiscal policy. What is monetary policy? The actions taken by the central bank of the country, which is RBI in, our, in, in India, is uh, which have an effect upon the cost and availability of credit and money or treated as actions of monetary policy. As I mentioned earlier, the central bank of the country has uh, the uh, power to print notes which constitute money. But this becomes the basis for further credit expansion. And uh, uh, the, the definition of money includes uh, not only um, uh, currency in circulation, but also uh, the demand and time deposits of the commercial banks. When the borrowing of the central Center of the of the government goes beyond its revenues. It borrows, they borrow, or the, the governments both at the center and states borrow. And when the borrowing goes beyond a particular limit, that is, there are not enough lenders let us say, to meet that borrowing, uh, then the only recourse for the government, the central government particularly, is to resort to borrowing from the Reserve Bank of India. And that has an impact with respect to inflation. Inflation, in the final analysis, is the co consequence of both the availability of goods and services and the extent of liquidity in the, in the system. Therefore, if the liquidity in the system increases, then it has a positive effect on inflation. That is, inflation increases. On the other hand, if the supply availability of goods and services increases, and then it has a dampening effect on inflation. So this is really in substance what inflation uh, theory um, uh, conveys. Therefore, in an attempt to control inflation, two courses of action, two courses of action are possible. One is to increase the availability of goods and services. The other is, to contain the liquidity 
beyond a particular point. That is why the new inflation targeting program was adopted by the parliament and became the framework, the policy framework for Reserve Bank of India. Uh, the objective of the Reserve Bank of India was clearly stated that it can go up to an inflation of uh, 4% plus or minus 2%. The goal should be to keep the inflation at 4%. But it can go up to 6% on the upper side and fall below up to 2% on the downside. In some sense, this has been effective. Um, and the first few years after the uh, new monetary policy framework was introduced, um, uh, the inflation was contained uh, um, and was fluctuating only between the comfort zone from 2% to 6%. But post-COVID, naturally, there have been problems because at the time of COVID, every policymaker or every policy analyst uh, pleaded for increasing public expenditure. This was a time at which the revenue was falling. With the result, uh, the fiscal deficit increased enormously. For example, the fiscal deficit in 2021 of the government of India um, went up to 9.2%, whereas what was considered to be um, tolerable was 3% of the GDP. But then it went to 6.8% in the following year. The next year it went to 6.5%. And the projected fiscal deficit for fiscal 23-24 is 5.9%. Um, um, to cut the long, long story short, what we really need to do as we move along is to ensure, to see that the fiscal deficit is, is brought down to the level over a period of time uh, to the 3% which was originally mandated. The mandate has been changed since then in terms of um, um, the debt GDP ratio, uh, the, um, the the amended FRBM Act uh, seeks for um, the debt GDP ratio uh, to be brought uh, to the level of sixty percent of the GDP. Um, um, the, this public debt level we are talking about is both of the center and the other states. But during the um, uh, COVID period, uh, the public debt uh, rose to 90% of uh, GDP. Uh, therefore, we really need to bring it down to the recommended level of 60% over a period of time. And we need a clearly uh, uh, guide map in order to reach that level. But the actual policy, um, the, 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 the actual mechanism required to achieve a lower public debt GDP ratio is really the fiscal deficit. Therefore, as I mentioned, we are uh, in this year uh, projected to achieve a fiscal deficit of 5.9%, but we really need as we go along uh, to bring it down uh, to the 3% level as early as uh, possible. It is not possible to bring it, bringing it suddenly. Uh, that will have a lot of consequences. Uh, therefore, but we need to have a clear guide map, um, glide path uh, to indicate uh, when we will actually get to the level of 3% of the GDP. But inflation also is also caused by sudden supply disruptions because of the floods, or because of the lack of uh, adequate range, the, uh, the, 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 there can be a supply bottlenecks, and as a consequence, prices might rise. But prices 
in the final analysis to be sustained will be sustained only if there is a liquidity increase. So we need to address in order to control the inflation two things. We look at what is need what is needed to correct the supply shortfalls, and also at the same time to ensure that the level of liquidity does not increase beyond what may be considered appropriate by the central bank. The two together will be able to bring down the inflation rate in, in our uh, country. Um, there are many, many more things about which I can uh, talk, uh, but um, in view of the limited time, I will stop here and maybe I will take a few questions uh, from the audience. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for your uh, valuable insights on both monetary policy and fiscal policy linkages. Uh, now, may I go to the question, sir? Uh, I have picked up three prominent questions from audience. Uh, we have so many questions, but uh, we have selected three prominent questions. May I go ahead with the first question, sir? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Can, so, can with, you come in? Uh, with the introduction, yeah, with the introduction of central bank uh, digital currency uh, in our economy, what new monetary policy tools will the central bank adopt to influence economic growth and stability? No, the digital currency is only an alternative to the physical uh, currency. Uh, therefore, um, in terms of monetary policy. Uh, the major concerns will be what I spelled out. The, the introduction of digital currency only makes it easier to deal with currency in the sense that uh, one does not have to carry because today, for, uh, if you want to use currency, it is in a physical form and you have to carry it with you. Whereas digital currency enables you not to carry that currency. Therefore, the introduction of digital currency per se does not alter the um, manner in which the monetary policy will have to be operated in order to achieve the objective. Thank you. Uh, the second question, uh, how does physical uh, decentralization and local governance impact the implementation of fiscal policy in Tamil Nadu? Well, um, I would say that um, the, it applies to all states. I mean, the, the, the answer applies to all states. The point really is, um, it is not so much a matter of fiscal policy as much as the overall policy of uh, um, implementing um, ideas and schemes. Uh, what is best? Well, what is the best way to, 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 to do it? There are local needs, there are local requirements which are perceived better by the local authorities. And therefore, those activities are better performed at the local level and the authority and the um, necessary um, power to implement those must be left at the local level. That is, that this, is, this is the basic principle. After all, there is the, at the center or at the union level, there's a government. At the state level, there is a, there, there's a government. And at the local level, and when we talk at the local level, whether it is simply at the city or the village level or some other figure, uh, configuration, at the level of the district or at the level of the taluk or whatever it is. Therefore, we can think in terms of um, various levels. But the, the, the idea is that some activities are better performed at the decentralized levels. And we should um, um, able to identify uh, those activities which are best performed at the local level and allocate the local uh, to the local level the authority to do it. But the authority to do it will be meaningless unless we allocate the resources to that authority. People only talk about state and the local level, but it is something 
the, the local level itself is, as I mentioned, not one level. It is a hierarchy of levels there also. Therefore, the center or the, the, the center must be willing to um, allocate um, um, or, uh, or center must be, or the union government must be willing to let the states perform those functions which are better performed at the state level. And the state in turn must also make up its mind that it must be willing to let certain functions to be performed at the local level, which are best performed by the, by the local level. Therefore, we really need to have the hierarchy of functions and the hierarchy of authorities. And these must be matched at the various levels, both in terms of authority or power, but also resources. Otherwise, the, the, this will not function effectively. Yeah, thank you, sir. And uh, the last question is from one of the student, UG student. Uh, it is said that uh, during the depression time, the role of monetary policy is limited rather than fiscal policy. Why? Well, the it, this goes into the uh, uh, question of what monetary policy can do and what monetary policy cannot do. Um, and how does monetary policy act? I initially said earlier that monetary policy functions or tries to influence the economy through actions which have a bearing on the cost and availability of credit and money. Um, therefore, in, in a depression period, when, uh, the, uh, when the activities have slumped, so to say, uh, the uh, whether making the credit cheaper will induce the um, uh, the borrowers uh, to uh, to to undertake activities or not Be because when the entire atmosphere or the environment is really gloomy um, the the, the the borrowers <coughs> may not have uh, the inclination to incur expenditures to start new projects. Therefore, the central bank may make available through the commercial banks larger amount of money at a lower credit. It is like the old saying, you can take the horse to the pond but cannot compel it to drink. So you can make available more credit at lower uh, prices but there are there takers for that is the main question. It is normally felt that in, in a purely depression period, the, um, the, 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 the attitude or the approach may not be to uh, borrow more, even at a lower rate of interest and to move on. Therefore, at that time, it is the role of the government to fill in the gap and move the economy forward. And once the economy moves forward, then monetary policy can one second begin to play a role. Therefore, when we talk about what the government can do at the time of the depression, this is really the um, public works program which people talk about. Uh, the, if the rest of the economy operated by the private sector is not generating uh, enough demand in the system is not generating enough uh, employment. Uh, then the government comes in and says that it um, it creates um, 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 uh, physical infrastructure which is badly needed. Otherwise, also builds those things, provides these um, uh, uh, expenses expenditure, and this is what is called also by called by pump priming. Pump priming in the sense, yes, as the, you know, in order to get water out, you put a little water into it and then uh, operate the pump, then water comes in, the, comes out. And then similarly, in the case of the economy also, where the private sector is not inclined to invest more, then the state can come and invest and start the economy moving then once the economy starts moving, 
then perhaps the uh, attitude of the private sector will also change and uh, uh, and therefore the um, the leadership role can be performed by the by by the the, uh, the government therefore the uh, uh, very often people talk about crowd in and crowd out it is very often said that when state intervenes and uh, starts um, uh, increasing ex expenditures people feel it crowds out the private expenditure but in a depression it may be the opposite the, the state incurring the expenditure may in fact result in the private sector of the economy incurring expenditures because the overall environment and the attitude and the climate gets uh, changed therefore instead of the public expenditure act acting as uh, 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 as crowding out private expenditure the the public expenditure may act as crowding in private expenditure uh, during the depression uh, period therefore during the depression purely depression period um, the uh, the, um, um, the the state has an important role to play um, students of economics will understand that the um, the central bank of the country in order to induce investment lowers the rate of interest but um, those who have read the keynesian theory will know what we call as a liquidity trap in the sense that once the liquidity increases beyond a point then further increase in liquidity does not even lead to a fall in the interest rate I and mean, i think it just stays there and therefore the the the, the issue clearly is that if the investment climate has to change during a period of depression, the government has an important role. But once the government has moved in, at the next stage, monetary policy can begin to act and push the economy further along. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your detailed explanation. Thank you so much. Uh, may I now uh, call Dr. Feriasamy to propose the thanks note. Thank you, ma'am. Thankful, thankfulness is the beginning of gratitude, and gratitude is the completion of thankfulness. A very good morning to one and all present here. I thank God Almighty for providing me an opportunity to deliver what of thanks on this momentous occasion. First and foremost, we would like to thank uh, our heartfelt thanks to Honorable Professor C. Rangarajan, sir former governor of RBI and current chairman, Madras School of Economics, Chennai, who accepted our invitation in spite of his busy schedule and enlightening us with his thought-provoking insights. This lecture has created more excitement and interest to learn the importance of policy instruments and their impacts on the economy. Sir, your remarkable contributions in the field of economics are highly inspiring and motivating to the young minds of our nation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Excellence is never an accident. It is a result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, skillful execution, and the vision to see obstacles as opportunities. Yes, we would like to take this opportunity to thank one such leader and backbone, Thiru Shankar Vanavaraya, joint correspondent. We extend our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Vijila Edwin Kennedy, principal, Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science, for her constant support and encouragement throughout in making this inaugural lecture a grand success. Thank you, ma'am. Our sincere thanks to all deans, heads of the departments, communication department, administrative and technical teams, and faculty members of class. I would like to register my special thanks to our department faculty members, Dr. Sukandamani, ma'am, Atmaramani, sir, and Sveta, Sri, ma'am, and Leo, sir, and his team for their 
unsustained support in making this event a huge success. We extend our sincere gratitude to all the principals of different colleges, faculty members, teachers, research scholars, parents, students, and other participants who actively participated in this event. Last but not the least, we would like to thank each one of you present here for your patient listening. And we are also very happy to announce that Dr. N. Mahalingam, Center for Public Policy of Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science, Koyamathur, will organize monthly lecture series with eminent speakers elucidating on public policies. We extend a warm welcome to all of you to actively participate and engage in the monthly lecture series. We will also update you about other significant actions of the center. Thank you all uh, on behalf of uh, Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and 